I would like to talk to you about a, what we think is a very interesting project that CIRM has funded. It's called the Antibody Use for Treatment or Prevention of COVID-19. This is part of a study that we call the COVID Plasma Study, and I encourage you all to go to covidplasmastudy.com to get more information about this and possibly even sign up as a donor of plasma. So let's talk about the virus and the antibodies that react to it. This is the virus that you've seen so many times. In red, of course, is the spike protein, the S protein. It's a trimer, that means it has three proteins, each of which is an S protein that has an S1 subunit, N-terminal, and it contains the key receptor binding domain that allows the virus to attach to cells, and an S2, sub, which is the C-terminal region of that. It has an internal protein called the nucleocapsid protein, which is very immunogenic, and then it has a number of other proteins in the membrane and the envelope of the virus, about which less is known immunologically. This slide looks a little confusing, but basically, if you look at the left side, these are positive COVID patients. They've all had positive tests, and they've been compared with those with, that have never had COVID because they, the serum was collected before there was any COVID-2. And you can see here that, and it, it displayed across the bottom is a number of viruses. The SARS-CoV-2 is right here. But then we have its cousin, COV, uh, which is really the SARS virus, COV-1. There's MERS, then there's the common cold viruses. So you see these people, mostly all of them had common cold antibodies. Some of them actually have cross-react with MERS. And then they all have the standard influenza, adeno, uh, parainfluenza, respiratory syncytial virus, with no difference between them. S1 and S2 are the most immunogenic, and N, N they are the most reactive uh, of the uh, antigens. And there's some cross-reaction between S2 and uh, the other common cold COVID, COVID-2s. The other thing that's important is to know that the antibody rises very early. It peaks at about two months and then it goes down. Some people go down to undetectable levels. Other people, it stays at a fairly high level. It's a function of severity as shown here. So if you have the need for high oxygen flow during your illness or you're on a respirator that's four or five, you have much higher antibody than if you had mild disease. So in summary, the antibody rises early. Neutralization is present very soon. Neutralization antibody has a wide range in patients. Um, the height of its peak, uh, but not the time to the peak, correlates with severity. And then longevity varies from as short as two months to much longer on an individual basis. So the question is, how do you capture this in what we call COVID convalescent plasma? Well, you go in for a plasmapheresis, and it shows a gentleman that has gone in, and he has become attached to this machine with blood flowing from one arm into the machine. It goes into a little centrifuge where the plasma is spun out of the blood. And you can see the red blood cells, the white cells, and the plasma. You collect the plasma, and you now have about 600 to 800 milliliters of plasma. And that can be divided into 200 milliliter units. And so one person make, can make between three and four units. They can give plasma about once every seven days, depending upon the, the center, seven to 14 days. CCP was used in the US for the first time in April of this year uh, by the Mayo Clinic study, we call it the extended access study, and eventually enrolled more than 90,000 recipients. And this was the basis for the FDA approval for an emergency use authorization that occurred on August 3rd, 2020, that allows the use of this material in hospitalized patients with COVID-19. Now, who can receive CCP now? Well, that group of people, obviously, the ones that are covered under the emergency use authorization. In addition, many clinical trials are ongoing around the country, both for early treatment or prevention after exposure. And these are controlled trials. And CCP is processed also into IVIG, and there's studies going on with IVIG, intravenous immune globulin. And we hope that soon there'll be intramuscular immune globulin for use in uh, ther therapy or prevention of COVID-19. So the main issues that we confronted was how do you identify a donor? They have to have convalesced with the, from the virus, and we like to see evidence of that, either in terms of a test or a, a test for the virus or a test for antibodies. 
We also want to see this go to underserved areas uh, in the state of California. Qualifying the volunteer for eligibility then is important. And then finally, determining whether the plasma is actually effective. Um, the large studies from Mayo were not controlled, and so they were controversial in that regard. Uh, they tend to be controlled in other ways by matched cases with those that got either high antibody versus no antibody, or those that got treated versus not treated. But we don't know if there's an antibody profile that could be therapeutic. And in fact, we really don't know what is actually in CCP that might be therapeutic. So that's the goal of our study, and this is shown here. So we want to assist centers in finding plasma. We want to characterize the titer and the neutralizing properties of that plasma. And then we want to evaluate the recipient to see what effect it had in that recipient. This is our website. I encourage you to go covidplasmastudy.com. It has multiple languages. Um, it has an online consent for plasma testing as well as plasmapheresis. The physician information uh, port portal is on this, this website um, and the physician can track um, the his, his or her convalescent donors. We have a multi-pronged strategy to get to all parts of the state, especially to cover the underserved communities. We start with the Alpha Stem Cell Clinic Network. We go to blood banks, we go to federally qualified health centers, other communities, health centers, et cetera, to try to get our message out. And this is actually what happens. In the light blue is what the donor sees. The donor goes online, he gets identified, he consents, he's screened, um, and then we collect two tubes of blood from him for testing, and we coordinate the plasma collection for that particular patient. Um, it goes to TGen. TGen is a, an affiliate of City of Hope. It's located in Phoenix and in Flagstaff, Arizona. It's a major coronavirus center of expertise. And there we undergo certain tests, which I'll describe to you in just a minute. Um, City of Hope does the neutralizing tests, and then the results are analyzed. In addition, the local physician finds his patient or her patient that is going to get the infusion, either under the EUA or, or, or an emergency IND, and that patient then has plasma collected before and after the infusion, and we analyze those results as well, both for antibody and for RNA. What kind of antibody test do we do? Well, the standard ELISA is done, and this is not that much different from many of the other ELISAs that you, you are probably familiar with. This one is made by InBios. It's, it's a good test. Uh, it is for the S protein. We qualify the donor with, with a... Uh, Qualification assay that proves he got enough antibody to be used as a donor. But then we can quantitate it as well. We can quantitate the antibody before and after infusion in the recipient, and then we can correlate that with, with outcome. We can also look at the peptide specific nature of the antibody. And now, here, what we've done is taken peptides from coronaviruses and we've linked them to a marker, which is DNA, to immunoprecipitate this. And then you can just sequence the result, and the DNA sequence will tell you what peptide the antibody recognized. This shows you the, the way that's done schematically. We basically have a number of libraries. These are basically peptides that have been labeled with a barcoded DNA, and some are to the nuclear protein in the spike, and they're 30 mers, some are 64 mers, and then some are combined with their cousins, let's say the other coronaviruses that are known. So we eventually have 100,000 30 mers that cover the full spectrum of coronavirus uh, peptides. This shows you the result of some of that epitope resolved, we call it detection of SARS-CoV-2 response. This one here is the result with S protein, the upper one, and N protein is the lower one. And, uh, and going from left to right is the sequence of the protein. And you can see where along that sequence the peptide occurs that targeted the antibody response. And the N protein is certainly more, very immunogenic as shown here. And we're trying to determine whether cross-reactivity to other COVIDs or whether any antibody profile correlates to outcome in our treated patients. We can neutralize as well. We can look for neutralization results. This is one example of a lentivirus that's been coated with a spike protein and that Virus also encodes luciferase. So if it goes into a cell, it lights up the cell and you can see it on a luminescence reader. 
But if antibody binds to that surface and prevents it from infecting the cells, there's no luciferase, and that means you've inhibited the virus. This is a pseudo neutralization test. The problem with an, a true neutralization test is that you have to use the actual wild virus, which is restricted to use in BSL-3 facilities. It makes it more difficult to do large numbers of studies. Here's another test that's available clinically, a surrogate virus neutralization test. Here you can actually put the receptor, the human ACE2 receptor on the plastic. This is a, a well from the microtiter plate. You can then have a HRP conjugated receptor binding domain. So this is a peptide to which you can then form a color reaction. And if it binds, then a color will, will appear. But if it doesn't, because it's been neutralized, you see no color. And that's an indication of neutralization. And there are several forms of this kind of surrogate virus neutralization test available. Finally, we want to see what happens, as I said, on that day after and at seven days after treatment with CCP. And so we have a nanostring methodology. This is a company that can detect in blood uh, several hundred RNAs, uh, RNAs that are tr transcribed in, in the peripheral blood. And they will reflect immunological events, innate immune re reactivity, adaptive immune reactivity, homeostatic things such as thrombotic events. And we're hoping to characterize the results uh, or the effects that are produced when CCP is used as therapy. So that's the summary of the study. This is our team and I thank them very much and I want to acknowledge them. Very helpful people. We are combined with TGen, with John Elton, I mentioned his work, Angela Cardosa, who does the neutralization test with us, our hematologists who oversee the review of the donors for the um, plasma paresis, the website under Cassandra Wesselman, an on-ramp bio, our outreach person, Katrin Tiemann, the various stem cell parts of the outreach, and then of course our project manager, Virginia Laverish. Thank you very much.